Last time we sort of wandered far afield. It was kind of fun. But uh, in thinking about it over the week, it occurs to me I should probably underline a few things. Um, one of the things that we take the liberty of doing in this group is to sort of wander. We, uh, we afford ourselves the luxury of wandering way off the track from time to time. And uh, but, uh, but I would like to make a couple of caveats. Um, last time we indulged ourselves in looking at a couple of... Uh, things that impact the long day of Joshua. Obviously, some of the comments of uh, Emmanuel Velikovsky and, uh, and perhaps uh, to some, at some length, the uh, model or proposal or ideas p put forth by uh, Patton, Hatch, and Steinhauer in their model of the Mars orbit and so on. Uh, those things, I think, are useful because they stretch our imaginations and they make us less um, myopic when we see passages in the scripture of things like the long day of Joshua. And because of that, I think they're useful on the one hand. On the other hand, I also feel it's worth underlining is that I think there's also hazard and danger in some of these things because the, the uh, a Patton Hatch Steinhauer model, for example, can be wrong. It's just an interesting thing to explore and it sort of stretches our imaginations or blindfolds our prejudices, if you will. But I think we should emphasize Acts 17.11 in that you should search the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. Uh, so I take some liberties because of the sophistication of this group, but I do want to underscore that uh, uh, we uh, can also fall into the trap of regarding too much some of these ancillary things. I'm one of these guys that happens to get very nervous about things like the Shroud of Turin and, and things of that nature because they can easily get in the way, get between us in a, in a devotional study of the Word as we get into these side trips. And I'm probably more guilty than most of indulging these tangents and, uh, and uh, by roads. So on the one hand, they're fun. On the other hand, it's uh, high time to turn back um, into the Scripture itself. Uh, last time, we uh, focused, of course, on the long day of Joshua in chapter 10 and got through verse 28. Um, and so we'll pick it up tonight there. And um, we're going to really conclude much of the battle scenes, if you will, in, in Joshua. We're going to, the pace is going to pick up here quickly. Um, we finished last time with a victory at Makeda. But uh, uh, at, uh, in verse 29, uh, we're going to summarize the southern campaign as it's sometimes categorized. Uh, then Joshua passed from Makeda and all Israel with them unto Libna and fought against Libna. And the Lord delivered it also and the king thereof into the hand of Israel. And he smote it uh, with the edge of the sword and all the souls that were therein. He let none remain in it, but he did unto the king thereof as he did unto the king of Jericho, which as you all, I'm sure recall, was hung until sunset on a tree, which is um, uh, the words getting around. Um, it's kind of, again, one of those things that we have a hard time swallowing that he, let, you know, he took no prisoners. I mean, he just, they, they put them all to the edge of the sword. That was God's instruction. That's what he told them to do. We're going to see again and again where they make exceptions. They live to regret it. Or I should say more than that, the regret goes on for many generations. Not only did they live to regret it, perhaps, but worse than that, their children of the third and fourth generation or whatever uh, bear the cost of not having totally cleanse the land. We're going to see that uh, a strange sort of contradiction in Scripture, because on the one hand, we're going to see in the book of Joshua, they get credit for taking the whole land as if they did it perfectly. God ascribes to them uh, success, if you will, in that sense. But if we look carefully, we find here and there they fail to really scrub the land clean, if you will, and what remains uh, goes on to haunt them through the rest of their history. So there's a lot of lessons there that we'll pick up as we go. But uh, uh, the general rule is that they really uh, uh, cleaned it out. In verse 31, it says, Joshua passed from Libna and all Israel with him unto Lashish and encamped against it and fought against it. And the Lord delivered Lashish unto the hand of Israel, who took it on the second day and smote it with the edge of the sword and all the souls that were therein, according to all that he had done unto Libna. And he's going to go on here for a minute, but one small point. We notice at Lashish that it was it didn't happen in one day. It, it, the, the Holy Spirit seems to record it took two days. It took a little longer. Uh, why he said it on the second day is a speculative thing that we never miss a chance to at least throw in our speculation too. We notice from looking at biblical history that Lashish was unusually tough to take. 
we find. For example, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, uh, laid siege against Lachish and finally gave up. He failed. We find that in 2 Kings 18, 2 Chronicles 32, and 2 Kings 19. You'll find that background. Jeremiah tells us in chapter 34 that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, was more successful than Assyria. This is sometime later. But even Nebuchadnezzar, uh, it was the last city that he succeeded in conquering. So as we study the scriptures, we note that from these other records, from the Assyrian uh, accounts in 2 Kings, and from the later account, the Babylonian accounts, as recorded by Jeremiah, Lachish seems to be, from its position in the terrain and so forth, particularly uh, uh, difficult to attack or uh, uh, more, more successfully defended. And it's only from that perspective that when we notice here in verse 32 that the Holy Spirit says he took it on the second day, we find just this subtle hint that Lachish is, um, not that the others necessarily took it one day, but we just get that tone in the text. The Holy Spirit is uh, suggesting that Lachish was a little tougher. And as we search the scriptures and we discover that Lachish in other accounts, under other conditions, was also more successful than others at resisting attack, we find a very subtle confirmation, if you will, of the integrity of the scripture, the the consistency, if you will. It's not the kind of thing that's designed or planted, and yet it's the kind of thing that you can notice if you watch for it. So it's a point I just make in passing. Um, okay, verse 33, And Horam the king of Gezer came up from Lachish, and Joshua smote him and his people until uh, he had left him none remaining. Uh, and then from Lachish, Joshua passed on to Eglon and all Israel with them, and they encamped against it and fought against it, and they took it on that day and smote it in the edge, uh, with the edge of the sword. And all the souls that were therein he utterly destroyed that day according to all that he had done to Lachish. And Joshua went up from Eglon and all Israel with him unto Hebron, and they fought against it. And they took it and smote it with the edge of the sword, and the king thereof and all the cities thereof and all the souls that were therein he left none remaining according to all that he had done to Eglon, but he destroyed it utterly and all the souls that were therein. Now, here and there, of course, you notice it, it happened in the same day. Other places, it's just silent. It's my personal presumption some of these may, may have taken several days long in these battles, of course, and yet for some reason, Lachius is recorded as a second day situation. But moving on, now, verse 38. Uh, Joshua returned and all Israel with him to Debir and fought against it. And he took it and the king thereof and all the cities thereof. Um, and they smote them with the edge of the sword and utterly destroyed all the souls that were therein. He left none remaining. As he had done to Hebron, so he did to Debir and to the king thereof, as he had done also to Libna and to its king. So Joshua smote all the country of the hills and of the Negev and of the Shephelah and of the springs and all their kings. And he left none remaining. But he utterly destroyed all that breathed, as the Lord God of Israel commanded. And Joshua smote them from Kadesh Barnea, even unto Gaza, and all the country of Goshen, even unto Gibeon. And all these kings and their land did Joshua take at one time, because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. And Joshua returned, and all Israel with him, unto the camp, uh, uh, unto, the camp to Gilgal. Summary of what's sometimes called the Southern Campaign. Chapter 11 is going to deal with the North. and uh, But uh, the key uh, battle we'll discover as we look at the book of Joshua is the battle. Well, Jericho, in a sense, uh, up front, but then uh, what really broke the back of the resistance was the battle at Beth Horon, the, the, uh, the uh, long day uh, thing that uh, we spent so much time on before. Um, it's interesting that Joshua, we look at Joshua, and we sort of say... Uh, on the one hand, we can admire him because he's quite a general. We're going to see just what kind of a general shortly. Um, I mean, in even more classical military terms. But um, uh, it's easy for you and I to say, well, because we see this emphasis all the way, well, the Lord fought for him. You know, I mean, who couldn't win as a general if you have the Lord on your side, right? And if you feel that way, read the Battle of Ai once more closely. But also recognize one of the, one of the observations that can be really shattering if you, when you really absorb it. As you read Joshua, it's easy to get excited about Joshua. He's a, a man of real strategic grasp and yet swift tactical action. He's one of these unusual mixes of apparently having a real grasp of the overview. He's an analyst. And yet, on the other hand, he's also, he doesn't mess around. He moves out fast. So you look at him and say, gee, that's dy dynamic. He's got the Lord behind him. And we see all these promises, how God makes walls fall down and has, you know, the sun stand still. I mean, who couldn't win in conditions like that? Well, the one thing you want to sort of remember, you can put it at the bottom of your notepad if you like, 
all the promises that Joshua had from chapter 1 on, you can find their counterpart in the New Testament to you. He, the Lord goes forth to fight your enemies just as he fought Joshua's. He may use slightly different techniques. Um, I'm not sure that he'll even keep the stop signal green when you pray for it necessarily uh, because he has other things that he may want to be teaching you. But uh, and that, So I'm not saying he's going to have the planet Mars swing by close by to alter the Earth's orbit because you've got some particular need on a particular day as, as Joshua did. Uh, uh, so you can easily misapply this on the one hand. On the other hand, in spiritual terms, it's very clear that every promise that Joshua had, the benefit of, you and I do too, in the New Testament, again and again. Uh, and uh, if you want a reference on that, just take the book of Ephesians. After we're through the book of Joshua, you can't read the book of Ephesians, I don't think, without recognizing the, the spiritual parallels. And if you need someone to hold your hand, I suggest you get Alan Redpath's famous book, uh, Victorious Christian Living, which is essentially a comparison of Ephesians and the book of Joshua. So uh, anyway, that ends uh, chapter 10. It ends what is called, uh, by those who are compelled to make Bible outlines, uh, the Southern Campaign, which leads us, interestingly enough, in chapter 11 to the Northern Campaign, for those of you making notes. Okay, chapter 11. Um, and it came to pass when Jabin, the king of Hazor, uh, had heard of uh, those things, that he sent to Jobab, the king of Madon, and uh, to the king of Shimron, and to the king of uh, Akshaph, and to the kings that were in the north of the mountains, and of the Arabah, the south of Chinnereth, and in the Shephelah, and in the borders of Dor on the west, and to the Canaanite on the east and on the west, and to the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Jebusite in the mountains, and to the Hivite under Hermon in the land of Mizpah. Wow. Uh, aside from my horrible pronunciation of those things, I should mention we have some idea where most of these are, but some of them still are s subject to some scholastic debate. As you probably have noticed, there's one word there that if you're a diligent student of the scripture, you will pick up, namely Chinnereth. And, or, uh, and that's a, one of the old names for what you and I know as Galilee. The Sea of Chinnereth is the Sea of Galilee, depending on which map you're looking at in terms of what its timing is, if you will. And, um, uh, so uh, uh, that gives you a clue that we're talking Galilee country. We're talking Golan Heights. We're talking north of the uh, north part of the land. Um, now, uh, bear in mind, there was a league in the south. We dealt with that, the Adonai Zedek punch and all of that. In the north, we have another alliance brewing here. They're shook up. They've obviously taken great note of what's been going on in the south. They've obviously heard of... Uh, of uh, uh, not only Jericho and uh, and uh, Ai and Gibeon, uh, uh, but they certainly have must have been impressed with what they've gathered went on in the Battle of Beth Horon. So these guys are shook up. It's interesting that their response to all of this is not repentance or negotiation. Their response is um, to take up arms. And, uh, you know, you may look at that and say, gee, that's kind of quaint. Isn't that dumb? I mean, wouldn't they have tried to negotiate? Well, when you feel that way, read the book of Revelation very carefully. One of the most fascinating observations in the book of Revelation with all these bizarre things, these cosmic planetary things happening in the book of Revelation, uh, that there's no repentance. That there is uh, the kings of the earth that take arms against the Lord and it's against his anointed, to quote from Psalm 2. Uh, the, re the only rejoicing in the book is when they give gifts because they think they've put an end to the two witnesses. And their resurrection in chapter 11 gets everyone's attention. And uh, so uh, the whole tone of the earth dwellers in Revelation is, no, is not different than the response of the indigenous um, dwellers on the land here. Uh, they make their various alliances and they do what they can, not realizing uh, what is really coming up against them. Now, verse 4 is kind of interesting. Uh, Chapter 11, verse 4, And they went out, they and all their hosts with them, many people, even as the sand is upon the seashore in multitude. By the way, that's a bunch. You know, uh, we treat that as a figure of speech, and we can't help but note that it shows up again and again in Genesis 22 and 32. In fact, in, uh, the, the, the offspring of, of Abraham are spoken of as the sand of the sea and the stars in the heaven. And some scholars make a distinction there. The sand of the sea is his natural progeny in the sense of people. And uh, that's that you find that phrase in, in uh, Genesis 32. But he also has offspring that are as, as like the, uh, as, as the stars in the heaven. Different phrase, different figure of speech. Maybe just a different figure of speech, but it has been suggested that that's 
the offspring of Abraham in the sense of faith. And they take the, the, the faithful, like in Daniel elsewhere, are mentioned that the shine as a star is forever. It's an idiom used of the faithful. So the two offsprings of David are sometimes mentioned that way. Here's one of those passages which is consistent with the idea of the sand of the sea, that even though it's a figure of speech, meaning many, a lot, innumerable, um, it, is, it is again spoken of, of a natural progeny here. So just as an aside, it's interesting that if that hypothesis is correct, that the two seeds of Abraham, that is the stars in the heaven, the sand of the seashore, that idiom may mean two different dimensions of those that can call Abraham father. Uh, those of you that are of a Jewish background uh, can point to him as a natural father. Those of you that are of you know, the faith in Jesus Christ can call him a father of faith, and, and we both fit. And So that's just a little... Uh, extraneous observation that may be wrong, but I share with you. Um, anyway, even at Santa's up on the seashore, and it says, with horses and chariots, very many. Now, this brings up a strange thing. Uh, this is the first place that horses and chariots show up here, particularly the war chariots. I should say the war chariot. Uh, chariots show up in the book of Joshua. And this is kind of an, a strange omission, because the Canaanites were very, very skilled at chariot uh, uh, skills and, uh, and techniques. And it's strange that they show up uh, so so late in a sense. They were not mentioned in the previous battles. One of the things of the initiative at Beth Horon, uh, the fact that they're in flight, that Joshua is so intent upon capitalizing on his victory quickly, implies that he had them on the run, and their inability to make use of their chariots may be hidden behind the text there. But here in the northern campaign, we're going to see it come right out in front. To give you some feeling for what Joshua is up against, we can turn to Josephus and learn that there are about 300,000 soldiers involved in this alliance, according to Josephus. About 10,000 cavalry and about 20,000 chariots. Now, those chariots are scary things. The chariots are um, uh, equivalent to what you and I would think of uh, conceptually or practically as a tank. And the chariots uh, were the terror of the infantry, um, partly because of the way they were constructed with sides and and spinning blades and the hubs and all that sort of thing. Kind of rough thing to have coming at you, horse drawn. Um, part of it because of what they, the way they were armed. They were typically um, uh, ar- uh, manned with not only a charioteer, but a javelin thrower and a bowman with arrows. And that made them pretty rough platforms to be mobile in, uh, in the field. And ver- they, thus they get their analogy to what you and I would call armor. As you may know that the United States Army today is organized in three main um, Groups: the the, inf- the infantry, the cavalry, and armor as the three types of of uh, equipments. Even though obviously the technologies change substantially, those labels are still used in those three main kinds of forces. And uh, armor being tanks and related, and uh, the chariots can be correlative of the armor. The horsemen can be obviously that's where we still call it cavalry, even though they don't ride horses. They they have a, a, a other equipments, but they're they're uh, those techniques are still uh, being used. Now, these chariots um, and the horses give rise to something that uh, might be worth exploring a little bit. Um, you might want to turn with me to um, Deuteronomy 20, verse 1. Now, let's turn to Deuteronomy 17, 16 first. Just take this in order. Uh, Deuteronomy 17... And we're interested in verse 16. Deuteronomy, um, yeah, 17, verse 16. It's an admonition here in the book of Deuteronomy to the king who says he shall not multiply horses to himself nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses for as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Now, among the many injunctions here for a king, there's this thing about not multiplying horses to himself. Now, you and I, uh, may or, you, know, you may or may not be sensitive to the fact that the Torah forbid horses in Israel. And that becomes a real problem that they disobey later. Gradually, as time goes on, you're going to discover climaxes, I guess, in Solomon's day, when he not only multiplied horses, he made a major economic gain by trading horses and chariots. He'd buy them from the east and sell them to the west, buy them from the south, sell them to the north, vice versa. And I've forgotten which way it was, but it turned out there was a main supply of horses, and the other side had a supply of chariots, and he traded them back and forth. And one of the main uh, trading posts that he set up, there were many he set up in Israel, Solomon did, one of them was a place called Megiddo. And while you and I are interested in Megiddo for prophetic reasons, 
Um, if you go to Megiddo, uh, you'll discover that the Tell, Megiddo, the, the mound there, has, uh, I, think is, I forget whether it's 12 or 20, I think it's at least 12, distinct layers. And they've actually built a model. The model opens up so you can see the 12 different layers of different civilizations that dwelt at Megiddo, one, one civilization building upon another, creating the mound. That's what a tell typically is. It's a hill, but it's in a sense a man-made hill. It's a hill that has derived from the repeated rebuilding of the towns in that location. And uh, so you'll come across this term tell this and tell that, meaning uh, there's tell down up north and so on. These are uh, places where typically an archaeologist, archaeologist can, can find many layers of civilization there. And Megiddo is at, it's at least 12 as I recall. But the point is, one of those earlier layers is Solomon, and the, and the stables are there, and you can see in the ruins and the excavations, so you can get into all that. But he was one that traded in horses. Now, uh, uh, we're going to find that uh, there, Israel wasn't supposed to mess around with horses from Deuteronomy 17.16. You might turn also to Deuteronomy 20, verse 1. There's more comments about warfare here, again, with chariots and things. It's Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 1. When thou goest to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee who brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And it goes on. It's, it's specifically anticipating the battle we're going to see in chapter 11, where these chariots are specifically named. Now, um, I don't know about you, but uh, I, we're going to find out that they're, Joshua and his gang are pretty rough on horses. Pretty rough on horses. So we, you and I probably are caught between two things. If we've done our Bible study carefully, we know that horses are something that Israel wasn't supposed to mess around with. And we try to be faithful to that as we go through, because we're going to see in the Psalms and all kinds of places, uh, uh, Psalm 20 and elsewhere, put not your trust in horses. So part of the thought that lies behind this is that Israel was supposed to trust the Lord, not on, not put their trust in chariots and such. Well, that's the one side. That's a nice biblical view. Now, if you don't have, I don't, you know, none of you probably have daughters that are into horses, you know, but let me tell you, uh, I do. So I was a little uncomfortable when I, when I find about all the things that happened to these horses. Um, and I, I, I was reminded while driving over here, I was thinking about this. It's funny how calloused we get in our entertainment. I'm reminded of a, of a movie, uh, and I've forgotten what movie it was, but the basic scene was uh, a small settlement. These are the good guys, you know, wives, children, farmers, and, and they are being decimated by a group of bandits. Some 10 or 20 horsemen are running through the place, tearing up the camp and shooting everybody. And uh, it's setting the stage, of course, for the plot, which comes later, and I've forgotten all that was about. But the point is, as they're riding through and shooting the men and the women and stuff, and we get so callous, you know, you sort of shrug that. But there's one part of the scene where there's the little dog, pet, right, is running across the clearing, and one of the bandits takes his gun and shoots the dog. And it was interesting, because um, the whole audience gasps in horror, <laughs> you know, killing men and women, you know, that's part of, you know, you know, we sort of, that's part of entertainment today with the violence, <laughs> but not the dog, you know, and it's funny, you have that reaction when you, there's something was extremely heinous about this bandit, the bad guy, the black hat, you know, shooting this dog. He's, and yet I had to laugh at myself because I caught myself the same way. Why is that so bad when here we're watching all these... It's funny how we have that mentality. And so... Uh, <laughs> but uh, so this whole business... I, I had a trouble with Joshua, you know, because they're going to give these horses a bad time. I thought, let's peel into that a little bit further. And you might find it kind of interesting to set, turn to Second Kings 23. 2 Kings 23. We'll get a, maybe another little insight of what's going on here. Second Kings 23, um, and I want verse, um, 2 Kings 23, verse 11. We're talking here about the revival of Josiah. Now, um, uh, as you know, the kings got, went from bad to worse, and from time to time, if someone that did a little better, Josiah was one of them. Josiah had a major revival during his day. When he took over, he knocked down idols and destroyed temples and brought the nation Israel back to a worship of the true God. Uh, in fact, it was under the, re the revival, the famous revival in Josiah, that there's a young guy that's being groomed under that. He was a small kid at the time, a guy by the name of Daniel. 
And when we read the exploits of Daniel, we should recognize that he was a product, if you will, of the revival of under Josiah. But in any case, one of the things Josiah does is he cleans up the act around there. And in verse 11 it says, And he took away the horses that the kings of Judah had given to the sun at the entrance of the house of the Lord by the chamber of uh, uh, Nathan Melech, uh, the chamberlain which was in the precincts, and he burned the chariots of the sun with fire. This is one of several hints we get at that you and I, unless we're tuned to this, would miss. Part of what's involved with the horses was worship. It wasn't just that they were instruments of war. And as we read Psalm 20 and so forth, we think, gee, the Lord didn't want them to have horses because that would cause their faith to be put on things rather than God. Well, that's true. But there's another dimension to the use of horses and chariots among the Canaanites that you and I, unless we've done a lot of scholastic digging, might not be sensitive to. The use of horses and their use in warfare was all tangled up with worship. And so part of what God was trying to do was to keep Israel from getting entangled in uh, the worship that was associated with horses. And we get that hint here. One of the things Josiah does when he cleanses the land, he took away the horses that the kings of Judah had given to the sun. And that in the Hebrew, that hint gives us a clue that these things were somehow involved in idol worship, not just as instruments of war. Now this gives me a marvelous opportunity to get in this business of worshiping horses or horsepower. Porsches. (laughs) Porsches. <laughs> Not Ferraris, of course. Yeah, that's different. But uh, uh, so uh, you can run with this one on your own of trying to extrapolate from the injunctions with Joshua to those things that uh, forms of locomotion, if you will, that uh, or warfare, if you will, that uh, you use on the freeways and how much of those can become something more than just an economical means of transportation. They become a thing in and of themselves. Uh, I can't carry this on too much further with getting in, without getting into real trouble. Um, either because of the car I drive or because of the Porsche owners that may be out there taking offense at what I'm saying. I'll just let the see if the shoe fits, uh, if the shoe pinches or whatever. Um, so we'll move right along quickly. Um, I think I got down to verse 4. We're talking about horses and chariots, very many. Verse 5, And when all these kings were met together, they came and encamped together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. Now, um, the waters of Merom. Merom is a major block to Galilee. Uh, it is the common central crossroads in the northern part of the land. And the, there is a place there where roads go in, all, in, in almost all the compass directions from a central point, and that central point is a narrow gorge of the Merom Brook. And um, all the major axes of communication converge on the central ridge of Mount Merom, and uh, so this turns out to be a, an ideal place to have some things happen. And one of the fascinating things is uh, the way Joshua, han- Joshua handles this. I had the opportunity to uh, have in my library a book, which I don't necessarily recommend unless you're a military uh, student of some kind and as an academy graduate that happens to interest me. So I, I happen to have gotten hold of a book called Battles of the Bible, which is a modern military evaluation of the Old Testament. The book is uh, very colorful, very interesting, somewhat of a disappointment because there's there's no supernatural over to, to it all. They, they, there's some real liberties taken, it, although it's interesting if you're a military um, a student by uh, Herzog and uh, Gihon who, who do the book, Chaim uh, Herzog and Mordecai Gihon. But the point is, what's interesting in this book is they do an analysis of each of the battles. They do an analysis of this one. And uh, they uh, they do lend by doing some careful study of the terrain. Uh, they uh, uh, highlight Joshua's generalship because they point out, now bear in mind, they have a strictly naturalistic view, an unbelieving view of the book of Joshua. So they take these supernatural overtones just with a grain of salt. As, uh, that's their attitude. But then, so that, that limits the usefulness of the book on the one hand. On the other hand, it's kind of interesting to see their view of Joshua's generalship. They feel that Joshua had a remarkable strategic grasp of the situation of the terrain and his enemies. At the same time, coupled it with very swift action. And they point out, in fact, their chapter that closes these battles uh, goes at some length to point out that uh, the concept of the preemptive offensive, which was exploited by Joshua, uh, is a model for all subsequent Israeli commanders. They point out that Joshua uniquely exploited three things, speed, stealth, and knowledge of the terrain. Those three factors uh, seem to have preoccupied Joshua in each of his engagements and gave him victory over a, an enemy that was vastly stronger and presumably uh, unconquerable. 
Uh, he did some clever things in their view by staying in the highlands. He minimized the advantage that his enemy had in numbers by moving quickly when the enemy could not muster its strengths uh, uh, and so forth. Uh, he, he, he is regarded in modern Israeli military doctrine as the model to follow. And I think that's very interesting. I think it's tragic that they don't carry that model far enough because if he's a model for all subsequent Israeli commanders, as they maintain, then it's too bad that the modern Israeli commanders don't avail themselves of the knowledge of God, as Joshua did. So you can carry that one step further if you like. But certainly, speed, stealth, and the knowledge of the terrain are the three cornerstones from a military science point of view that Joshua seems to so marvelously exploit in each of his battles, but particularly here. His handling of the reversal at, uh, at uh, AI, in the second campaign at AI. His, uh, his recognition that the, for, the I start to say forced march, but the, you know, the, the, the 30 miles over you know, in, in the 45 hours kind of thing that he got to, to, uh, to Gideon with, and his, his recognition of the need to seize the complete victory at uh, Beth Horon. All these things are uh, uh, highlights of an a impeccable general, and he does a good job. And so that's kind of so. At the, at the battle at the waters of Merom, we're going to see some of this. Uh, verse five: When all these things were met together, they came and encamped together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. So this alliance, this group, are right at the crossroads to Galilee country, and it's the they're right in the path of of, uh, of an attempt to block uh, access, if you will, to Galilee. Verse six: And the Lord said unto Joshua, Be not afraid because of them. For tomorrow about this time will I deliver them up all slain before Israel. And thou shalt hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. Now the word hamstring, we're not quite sure what, there's all kinds of arguments as to what they really did. Did they just kill them? Did they hamstring them? Uh, there's, there's scholastic arguments as to exactly what they did. Uh, and obviously it was something the horses did not enjoy. Um, uh, but uh, uh, So I'm not here to debate the Hebrew. It was, yeah. Um, now, uh, this, uh, um, I might mention the location here also is the plain of Esdralon. And uh, it's kind of interesting as we read this battle to put it in historical context. And I use the term historical looking forward as well as back. Um, this is the source of a couple of very important victories. I mean, the source of the site, the site of very important victories for Israel. Uh, Barak uh, had his victory over the Canaanites in Judges chapter 4. And um, Gideon had his victory over the Midianites in Judges chapter 5 at this general area. Uh, it also is the uh, scene of a number of disasters. It's where, it, it, it was the site of the death of Saul and Jonathan, as recorded in 1 Samuel 31, and the disaster of Amaziah in 2 Kings 9, and the, and the death of Josiah in 2 Kings 23. And um, it's sometimes, that, which, that, whose death, by the way, we talked about Josiah and his, his revival, it's his death in this area is sometimes called by historians the sunset of the kingdom. It was the, 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 the twilight, if you will, of the empire. Now, before we go any further, it's also interesting to see how Zechariah chapter 12 highlights this area. Zechariah chapter 12 um, has this famous passage in verse 10. There's much we could, it's hard to just take a little peek at Zechariah without getting, uh, you know, in a 20 million tangents, but let's take Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, where he records the Lord saying, I will pour out on the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, that's very specific, the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. One of the remarkable passages in the Old Testament, recognizing the form of capital punishment in those days was stoning, not crucifixion. That was invented some many hundreds of years later. But anyway, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. What an interesting New Testament type phrase to find tucked away here in Zechariah. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and be in bitterness for him as one is in bitterness for his firstborn. Notice verse 11. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem. What day is he talking about? The day that, no, not the crucifixion. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. It's the second coming of Jesus Christ. And in that day there shall be great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadrman in the valley of Megiddo. Now see, when I tip you off that this is Megiddo, you can look at Revelation 16, 16, where it says, and they, they shall, the Lord shall gather them together in that day uh, in a place which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Har Megiddo. Har is the term for mountain. Okay, Mount Megiddo. And uh, so this is 
uh, uh, in that area. It's north, uh, Megiddo perhaps a little to the west, and, and of course the Sea of Galilee quite a bit to the, to the, to the east. But that's, it's Galilee country we're talking about. And so that's, uh, uh, with that kind of an overview, let's uh, pay note, take note to what happens here. Verse 6. <clears throat> the Lord said unto Joshua, Be not afraid because of them, for tomorrow about this time. I like the way the Lord calls his shots. I don't know if you watched a pool player, but this, is, uh, he's, this one's good. He, tomorrow about this time uh, I will deliver them up all slain before Israel. Thou shalt hamstring their horses and burn the chariots with fire. So Joshua came and all the people of war with him, against them by the waters of Merim suddenly, and they fell upon them. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, who smote them, who chased them uh, unto the great Sidon, and unto Mishrephoth Maim, or something like that, and uh, into the valley of Mizpah eastward. And they smote them until they left of them none remaining. And Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots with fire. And... Um, and Joshua at that time turned back and took Hazor and smote the king thereof with the sword, for Hazor had been the head of all these kingdoms. And they smote all the souls that were therein with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was not any left to breathe, and he burned Hazor with fire. And all the cities of those kings and all the kings of them did Joshua take and smote with the edge of the sword, and he utterly destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded. But as for the cities that stood still in their strength, Israel burned none of them, except Hazor only. That did Joshua burn. And all the spoil of those cities uh, and the cattle and the children, the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves. But every man they smote with the edge of the sword. Until they had destroyed them, neither left they any to breathe. And the Lord, uh, as the Lord commanded Moses his servant, so did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua. And he left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. Fast mover. Um, now, some of the military analysis of this battle is kind of interesting. They point out that if the horses were unharnessed, like just before or after watering, okay, uh, that they are at best a nuisance. When I, see, if, what Joshua did, he, he, surprised, he surprised them. If the horses were harnessed but undeployed, they're worse than a nuisance. They become a hazard to the ground troops. So what's lying behind this is the idea that Joshua seized the initiative, moved quickly. So even though the, his enemies were concentrated around the, the brook Merim, that he was able, by, by moving very quickly, to put them in th their, their advantage. These, what, 20,000 chariots were a disadvantage because they just added to the confusion and were, uh, 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 were counterproductive, if you will. And uh, so... Uh, it's interesting that even in military terms, oh, they've, they've studied the terrain carefully. They even make guesses as to where they think the outposts were, the Canaanite armies and all this. And it's interesting by moving very quickly uh, that he was able, by the concentration of this uh, uh, narrow gorge and the inability to deploy these chariots, uh, uh, they lost their advantage and, in fact, had a disadvantage uh, in, in, the, in the situation. So um, that's the Battle of Merim. And uh, uh, we're now going to come to a summary of the conquests. And um, gives us there's a couple of real neat tangents here. So any of you think that we're going to get very far, relax. We got all kinds of uh, things. Um, yeah, okay. Let's just keep moving. Uh, uh, verse 16. Summary of the conquest from here to the end of the chapter. So Joshua took all that land and the hills and all the Negev and the land of Goshen and Shephelah and Arabah and the mountain of Israel uh, and the valley of the same, even from Mount Halak and uh, that goeth up uh, to Seir. Pardon me, to Seir, even unto uh, Baal Gad into the valley of Lebanon under Mount Hermon and all the kings he took and smote them and slew them and Joshua made war a long time with all those kings how long total how long was the total campaign of the conquest of Canaan seven years seven years those of you that are revelation hobbyists will note that the Joshua defeats these seven nations originally ten in seven years uh, kind of interesting how do we know that? Well, you compare Joshua 14, which we're going to get to later, and uh, Deuteronomy 2.14, we discover that Caleb was 85 when the thing was over. He was called at 40. Then there was 38 years in the wilderness, so he was 78 when the thing started. He was 85 when it was over, so there's seven years. We date it primarily from the, some other implications, but he dated from the ages that we can infer from Caleb before and after. So it apparently spans a seven-year period, for those of you that... I'm wondering how he got into that thing, because if you look around for seven years, you may have a tough time finding it. It's inferred from the comments that are made by Ca about Caleb. 
So uh, he made a, he made, just as Joshua made it war a long time with all those kings. And it was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel, save the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon. All others they took in battle. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly, and that they might have no favor, but that he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. And at that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakim from the mountains, from Hebron, from Debir, and from Anab, and from all the mountains of Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel. Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. These Anakim. We're going to come back to these Anakim. They're kind of interesting characters. Uh, but I want to pick up, I want to go to the end of the chapter so we at least get this chapter done before we get wandering off. And um, The Anakim. Verse 22. There was none of the Anakim left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza and in Gath and in Eshdod there remained some. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord said unto Moses. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel according to their divisions by their tribes, and the land rested from war. Now, this is the end of the battles. Chapter 12, which we'll get into as time permits, is a summary of just all the kings. So the first 12 chapters of Joshua are the battle. The last, from here on, chapter 13 on, we're going to divide the land. And there's a lot of interesting things there, that we'll, but we'll go at a little uh, more rapid pace, but we'll cover the, the, the last part of the book is the division of the land and how uh, they're given uh, divisions of the land by tribes. And uh, there's some interesting things that come out of that. It sounds like it would be just a dull chronology. Quite the contrary, there's some interesting things that will, will leap out at, at, to us as we go. But um, I want to talk a little bit about these Anakim. We notice that um, Joshua uh, cleansed the land of the Anakim, except there were a few that sort of slipped through, I guess, and they lived in Gaza, in Gath, and Ashdod, those three cities being Philistine country. If you, you know, it's on the west edge, right there on the Mediterranean. Uh, there's an area you literally visit today as Philistine country. You've all heard of the Gaza Strip, same place. Gaza, Goth, and Ashdod are all in that area, and they're basically the, the main power base of the Philistines. And uh, uh, we'll read much about the Philistines as we go further. But I'd like to explore a little bit about these Anakim because they're kind of interesting. Uh, they first show up uh, overtly in Deuteronomy 9. If you'll turn to Deuteronomy 9, um, in uh, in, in uh, the first couple of verses of Deuteronomy 9, it says, Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over the Jordan this day to go to in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fortified up to heaven. A people great and tall, the children of the Anakim, whom thou knowest, and of whom thou hast heard say, Who can stand before the children of Anak? Now you wonder, Chuck, what are you doing? What are you, are you going to make a mountain out of this one? This is a strange passage, and yet the way it's placed should catch your attention because uh, they're, going, uh, they're being challenged to go against a people great and tall, the children of the Anakim, Anakim being just the plural of Anak, Anakim being just like seraphim, our plural of seraph, or cherubim, our plural of cherubs, right? Anaks are Anakim in the Hebrew, it's the plural of Anak. And, and they are apparently a proverb. Who can stand before the children of Anak? And what we're trying to raise the question is, who on earth is Anak, and what's going on here? Mercury. Thor's day, Jupiter, Thursday. Freyatot was their name, the Teutonic name for Venus. And, of course, uh, Saturday for Saturn. So the days of the week that you and I use go back to the Teutonic naming of our days. I wonder why. And why is there Halloween October 31? There's a whole thing there about the Druids. The Celtic year ended it October 31st, and they had bonfires, and it was a bad luck time because of fears that surrounded October. And um, there's a, you can compare that with the Phoenician uh, themes of Baal and Ashtoreth and all of that. Now, um, some of this Vilikovsky take, takes on, but what I want to do now is share with you something that again may be wrong, but it's interesting. So just be patient with me. Uh, three guys uh, published some papers back about ten years ago, a little over ten years ago. A guy named Donald Patton, Ronald Hatch, and Lauren, Dr. Lauren C. Steinhauer. 
And I want their ideas just to stretch your minds. I'm not here to sell them, but to give you a flavor of their backgrounds. Patton was a geographer, historian, and author, and has done some writing about creation of the biblical flood. Ronald R. Patch was a mathematician, a physicist, and orbital analyst. He wrote the computer programs for developing satellite-based navigation. He worked in the Applied Physics Lab, John Hopkins University, for the Navy Satellite Program, worked for Boeing and Magnavox and others in satellite, you know, computer models of, of, of orbital mechanics. Dr. Lawrence E. Steinhauer is a uh, theoretical mathematician. He taught aerodynamics and, method and orbital mechanics and applied mathematics at Harvard, MIT, and the University of Washington. So these guys are kind of, you know, uh, neat dudes. They have a hypothesis. They've done some studies, and they have a hypothesis that may be wrong. But I think it's worth sharing with you. They have noticed all the things I've mentioned so far, and they're obviously well aware of Velikovsky's work, but they have a different view, and they have access to different information than Velikovsky did. They notice that if they study the Bible and the Talmud and the Mishnah and the ancient Hebrew records, that in the Bible one can identify seven major what they call catastrophes. This includes Sodom and Gomorrah, the Exodus. Incidentally, they separate the flood as a special situation. I won't get into that right now. But the uh, uh, and of course um, um, they start. Actually, what they do is they start with the days of Peleg, the Tower of Babel, Sodom and Gomorrah, some catastrophes that occurred during the days of Job, the Exodus, the Long Day of Joshua, some things that happened in the days of Deborah and Samuel, two things that happened in the days of David, Elijah, Joel, Amos, and and the big thing, the big one that we want to talk a little bit about is on Isaiah. Uh, during the time of Isaiah in 701 B.C. Now, when they look at all of this and they start analyzing it, they discover some interesting things. They discover, first of all, that all of these things appear to have occurred in either March or October. Well, this gives me the feeble excuse to leap to a story that you all know about one of the children of Anak. 1 Samuel 17 describes a story that we all know and love and grasping at the most feeble excuse to leap into a narrative, uh, we will look at um, <laughs> um, 1 Samuel 17. And there's a very famous story here that you, you all know. And I want to take the occasion to examine tonight. The story of one particular member of the Anakim, whose name happens to be Goliath. Um, and it's kind of fun to read this story. Um, we'll skim through it rather hurriedly, and yet not so fast as not to pick up a couple of things. Um, you all know the general story, the men of Israel under King Saul. Now, back in chapter 16, verse 14, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. So Saul's in deep trouble at this point. The Spirit of the Lord is not with Saul. And lest you read that and be concerned, you notice that David could pray when he repented over Bathsheba. He said, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. See, this is the Old Testament. These are times when the Holy Spirit would come and go like the breeze and like the wind. The most amazing thing that blew Paul's mind is the promise that the New Testament believer has is that the Holy Spirit cannot be revoked. He's given to you as earnest money, as a down payment, as proof that he cannot be taken away from you. And Paul makes a big thing of that in his letters. So don't get concerned when you read the Old Testament that the Spirit of God departed if you have the Spirit of God, you have the most, most incredible security that you can have, uh, as, as Paul's letters, I think, amplify well. But anyway, Saul here is in deep trouble. He's the king of Israel, and um, the Philistines are their enemies. And they do a very civilized thing. They sort of stand on one bank of this gorge and Israel on the other and say, hey, instead of you know all this carnage, we'll take our best, you take your best, and we'll let that combat tell the day. Okay. And uh, the Philistines thought that was a terrific idea because they have this particular champion that they set up here. Verse 4, it says, there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath. Notice Gath. Where did he come from? Same place the Anakim is mentioned in Joshua. Notice how the Anakim settled in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. One of these Anakim is this character. We get some insight as to what an Anakim is by taking a good close look at this guy Goliath whose height was six cubits in a span. Have you ever heard the expression that uh, the guy's ten feet tall in our language? Uh, that's six cubits in a span. This guy's ten feet tall. And you figure, well, that's just a figure of speech. He was just maybe a little overgrown, sort of a maybe a heavy, you know, 
uh, you know, fullback type guy. Well, um, we find he had a helmet of bronze upon his head as he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. By the way, I said 10 foot tall. It's actually 9 foot 6 inches. I Pardon me if I'm exaggerating here a little bit. I get carried away from time to time. Um, 9 foot 6 would do it, though. I think if I was against a 9 foot 6 guy, I would <laughs> not quarrel if he's not quite 10 feet tall. Um, he had shin armor of bronze upon his legs and a javelin of bronze carried between his shoulders. His, a st- the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. That's a strange phrase, a weaver's beam. You'll find it come up again later. And, that's a, and his spear's ha- head weighed 600 shekels of iron and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine? And ye servants to Saul, choose you a man... F- For you, and let him come down to meet me. If he be able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. If I prevail against him and kill him, then uh, shall ye be our servants and serve us. And so there's this dare, this confrontation, which, of course, is elaborated. And, of course, David has been sent on an errand to bring some things, a little care package from home to his brothers there who are in the army. So he's a young kid, and he's visiting the big camp, and he's uh, 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 he's the youngest guy, and... uh, uh, in the in the family, and so he uh, went and re- uh, verse 14. Uh, David was the youngest; the three eldest followed Saul. David went and returned to Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself forty days. This challenge, this dare, has been going on for some time. And uh, so uh, uh, David's father Jesse uh, gives them some uh, in verse 17 some grain, some loaves, and to take them to the camp and some cheeses. In other words, just a whole whole. Uh, care package from home. And uh, so David goes up there, and he's really distressed when he sees, A, this challenge being given Israel. And the army, not right, you know, everybody's murmuring and, and uh, trembling and not sure what to do with it all. And uh, so um, uh, David doesn't understand what, why they hesitate. Isn't God on our side? See, David's got it all figured out. He's not, he's not mature enough or old enough to get cynical, nervous. You know, he's... If I could use the expression, a young Christian, he hasn't had enough experience to get doubt. You know, he, he's uh, he's ready to go. So uh, David, verse twenty six. David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, "What shall be done for the man who killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God?" You can imagine how that endeared him to the sergeants, the lieutenants, and you know. Yeah, there's an expression in the Marine Corps, you know, it's always 2% that doesn't get the word. Eh? Um, so anyway, uh, so they, uh, um, his brothers get upset with him in verse 28, and why come down here, and uh, and with whom have you left the sheep back home, and so forth. And they they just consider him prideful and so forth. And, uh, boy, if we could have pride like he did. Let's take a look at this. Uh, the challenges continue, and we get to verse 31. Then the words that were heard by David spoke. He reported them to Saul, and they sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. <laughs> can, you pe- can you imagine King Saul? He's probably very tall. And here's this kid. I, I don't know how old David was, but he's a kid. She's pretending she. And, uh, and he's going to take care of He's going to take care of this. Um, Saul said, David, thou art not able to go against these Philistines to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. In other words, Goliath is not only big and well-equipped, he's trained for this all his life. This guy is a brute. David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after them, and smote them, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. He rubs it in right there. The armies of the living God. Uh, he's right on. Uh, I don't know how that hits all. That probably bothered him a little bit. Anyway, David said, Moreover, the Lord hath delivered me out of the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And um, now, and Saul armed David with his armor. <laughs> put on a helmet of bronze on his head, and also he armed him with a coat of mail. Now, this is the fun scene. You can just uh, sketch it in your own mind. This kid wearing Saul's armor. That's got to be a joke. Uh, That's got to be a caricature. You can just visualize it. David girded his sword about his armor, and he attempted to go, but he had not tested it. That's polite King James for saying he was in bad shape. And and, And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. If I pause, it's because I'm rejecting mischievous cracks to make. I'm going, so don't consider that 
that pause anything but maturity, rejecting the kind of quips. Anything. So he took a staff in his hand, he chose five smooth stones out of the brook, put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a, uh, a wallet, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near to David, and, and, the, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and a ruddy and a fair countenance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? The Philistine cursed David by his gods. Now, you can get David's frame of mind. This is just, you know, that's dynamite. David's ready. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh to the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Didn't mention his sling. That's not what David came up against Goliath with. He came up against Goliath with the faith in the living God. Now, this is what I call grandstanding, the way I think God would ordain us. You know, you and I, we think we have faith when in the privacy of our prayer closet, we sort of claim that, gee, maybe tomorrow will be better or something, Right? David is going up before everybody. I mean, visualize the valley there, and on one bank you've got all the, the army, who on the one hand I'm sure are cheering him on, on the other hand wondering what's this kid doing, he's lost his mind. On the other side we have the enemies of the God of Israel, standing there with their cracks and their jeering and whatever. And David, he has no assurance has he had some vision that he's going to win? Did he know how the story's going to come out? You think so, the way he's acting. Um, interesting kid. Um, this is uh, calling a shot beforehand. Um, dynamite. I don't know how, you know, I, I, I'm always impressed where Daniel, and Daniel's three friends in the, you know, they, they uh, in the fiery furnace, you know, where they're threatened to go in the fiery furnace. And they tell Nebuchadnezzar, you know, that our God's able to save us. If he doesn't, that's fine, too. That's up to him, but we're not going to bow down. I mean, they just, they really just grandstand it. And Daniel 2, and Daniel 2, with the, in chapter 2. with the, It's interesting how these men of God moved with the confidence that God was behind him, uh, or in front of him, maybe even more precise. And uh, so David goes on here, verse 46, This day will the Lord deliver me into thine hand, and I will smite thee, and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, uh, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. It's strange that he says carcasses, plural. How many people did David kill? One, huh? Okay. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with the sword and the spear, for the battle is the Lord's. He will give it you, uh, give you into our hands. And it came to pass that when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Okay. This, uh, okay, David put his hand in his bag and took from there a stone and slung it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. And the stone sank in his forehead and he fell upon the face of the earth, uh, upon the earth. And David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran, stood upon the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and slew him and cut off his head with it. And the Philistines saw their champion was dead and they fled. Uh, that's got to shake him up a little bit. Uh, I can't, it's hard for me to, on the one hand, uh, you know, uh, communicate the seriousness of this on the one hand, yet it's so, I, I, I visualize it so amusingly. Here, this kid is standing on this Philistine. I visualize him drawing a sword. It was probably longer than David was. And, 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 you know, going, finishing, finishing the job. And we can go on about this. And what's fun about this, one of my favorite things, if you're playing a Bible trivia game, you can build up the whole case. Did David have faith? Would you say David's faith was pretty evident? Pretty complete? Pretty unqualified? I mean, all the way? Why'd he pick up five stones? When he crossed the brook, verse 40, he took a staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones. Now, there's a lack of faith, after all. Um, one was enough. How many did David need? One. Why did he pick up four more? He had four brothers. Oh, you guys have done your homework. Four brothers. Well, Goliath had four brothers, and those of you that want to chase that down, um, dare I? Why not? I've blown it already. Let's turn to um, where you find that out is in Second Samuel 21. 2 Samuel 21. 2 Samuel 21. And you have to dig into this a little bit, but in, the, in verses 15 through 22, you find that there's a group of guys that get killed. But you've got to read it very carefully to see what's going on here. 
The Philistines had yet war against, uh, with Israel. David went down, his servants with him, and they fought against the Philistines. And David grew faint. Now, by now, David, you know, he's, he's, he's a heavy dude. We're in 2 Samuel now. And David is growing, growing faint. And uh, Ishbimonab, who was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of bronze in weight, and being girded with a new sword, thought of slaying David. But Abishai, the son of uh, Zeruiah, came to his aid and smote the Philistine and killed him. And then the men of David swore on them, saying, Thou shalt no more go out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. In other words, what they're saying is, David, you can't go into battle on the chance you might get hurt and destroy the... You know, you're, you're too important. We'll fight the battle. You, you, uh, you're too valuable to be out here. So they forbid him from engaging anymore in this uh, frolic. And uh, it came to pass after this that there was again a battle in the, with the Philistines at Gob. And uh, Sibachai, the Hushathite, slew Saf, who was one of the sons of the giant. And there was again a battle in Gob in the Philistines where Elohim, the son of some other unpronounceable name, a Bethlehemite slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff whose beer, spear was like a weaver's beam. There's that link again. And there was yet a battle in Gath where there was a man of great stature who had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he was also born to the giant. And he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shammai, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath who fell by the hand of David, uh, by the hand of his servants, and so on. And what's not clear, but they're all, but they're all sons of the giant, the giant being the parent, the father of Goliath. But um, four, four brothers, five altogether. And it's interesting that David, crossing the brook, picks up five smooth stones. Did he need them for Goliath? No, he was just ready for the four brothers if they want to make trouble. Dynamite story. Uh, I guess I have to return back to Joshua chapter 11. But when you see the Anakim, uh, these are... Strange stories because you think, well, gee, they're just real tall. Nine foot six is kind of impressive. But what's also bizarre is the six fingers on each hand and the six toes on each foot. And so whatever these creatures are, they are strange. And this is hinted at in Genesis 6. It says there were giants in the land, the Nephilim, and also after that, meaning even after the flood. So there's some thought, no proof, just speculation, that there may be some link, some genetic link between the Anakim and the problems that caused God to flood the earth, to rid the earth of all its generations, except the one who had a clean genealogy. Upright in all his generations, your King James says in Genesis 6. So it's possible, not necessarily required, but it's possible that the Anakim bears some kind of mysterious link back to the Nephilim, the giants, the fallen ones that are talked about in Genesis 6 which, as you know, if you, uh, uh, it's my view, and it's certainly not, not, not universally held, that the, uh, the Nephilim were a supernatural, strange offspring that God had to cleanse the land. And that those traditions are not only from Genesis 6, the pre-flood period, but also embodied in our other myths and legends, the demigods and so forth. And so I, have, I hold what's sometimes called the romantic view of Genesis 6, that the Bar Elohim, the sons of God and the daughters of men, is something that uh, is uh, not just a... Believing, you know, the the believing line and the non, you know, the call, be separate kind of thing. Because when believers and unbelievers have children, they're not unnatural. These children are unnatural. So something else is going on in Genesis six. And if you really want to get into that, I suggest you get the Genesis, the tapes on Genesis six, uh, and uh, be prepared to. Uh, don't go into that particular chapter on Genesis six if there's a roaring fire and a storm outside. It's pretty spooky stuff, but it's kind of fun if you. Uh, anyway. Um, Okay, um, at this point, let's um, keep moving. Um, yeah, okay, um, just give me through here if there's any other wild tangents we can take, but I think that's uh, the main thing. Uh, this, this summarizes anyway the end of the battles. Chapter 12 is really just a recap of all these, of all the kings. Um, now, these are the kings of the land. Now, by the way, uh, verses 12, excuse me, chapter 12, verses 1 through 6 are east of the Jordan, and chapter 7, I mean, verse 7 to the end, to verse 24, are west of the Jordan. And uh, so uh, we'll just skim through this. Now, these are the kings of the land whom the children of Israel smote and possessed their land on the other side of the Jordan toward the rising of the sun, that is the east side, from the river Arnon unto uh, Mount Hermon uh, and all the Arabah on the east. Sion, the king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon, who ruled 
from uh, Arar, uh, which is up on the bank of the River Arnon, and from the middle of the river, and from half Gilead even unto the River Jabbok, which is the border of the children of Ammon, and from the Arabah to the Sea of Chinnereth on the east, and unto the um, the Sea of Arabah, even the Salt Sea on the east, uh, the way to Beth Shemath, or, and uh, from the southward to the slopes of Pisgah. Boy, this is tough. Um, uh, and the border of, uh, of Og, the king of Bashan, who is the remnant of the giants who dwelt at Ash, Taroth, and in Andrei. Now there's the giants referred to again. Um, and reigned at, uh, in Mount Hermon, and uh, Selica, and Al Bashan, and the border of the Geshurites, and the Mekarites, and half, the, uh, and half Gilead, the border of Sion, the king of Heshbon. Them did Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the children of Israel smite. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave it for a possession unto the Reubenites, Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Reminding you that the two and a half tribes, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, had elected to take their inheritance east of the Jordan. And uh, that's going to come up again shortly when the land is divided. But the, these battles then, verses 1 through 6, occurred prior to the crossing of the Jordan. They're east of the Jordan. Now we get to the other side. Uh, verse 7. And these are the kings of the country which Joshua and the children of Israel smote on this side of the Jordan on the west. The west bank. May I try that? Um, from Baal Gad unto the valley of Lebanon, even unto Mount Halak that goeth up to Seir, which Joshua gave unto the tribes of Israel for a possession unto, according to their divisions. In the mountains and in the Shephelah and the Arabah and in the springs and in the wilderness and in the Gev the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. And now it's going to list them. The king of Jericho won, the king of Ai, which is beside Bethel won, the king of Jerusalem won, the king of Hebron won, the king of Jarmuth won, the king of Lashish won, the king of Eglon won, the king of Gezer won, the king of Debir won. In other words, these are each one as each king. I was, you're going to end up being 31 of these kings. Um, the king of Libna won, the king of uh, Adullam won, the king of Makeda won, the king of Bethel won, the king of Tapua won, the king of Hefer won, the king of Aphek won, the king of Lasharon won, the king of Madon won, the king of Hazor won, the king of uh, Shimron Miron won, the king of Akshaf won, the king of Tanakh won, the king of Megiddo won, the king of Kadesh won, the king of Jachnium of Carmel won, the king of Dor in the height of Dor won, and the king of Goim in Gilgal won, and the king of Terza won. All the kings, 30 and 1. So ends chapter 12, and so ends the first half, or the main section, if you will, or the, the combatant half, if you will, of the book of Joshua. Now, uh, it's interesting that um, that the Holy Spirit chooses to enumerate these kings, and it's also struck me as kind of strange that um, it, in order to get the 31, the, the, the Holy Spirit reaches east of the Jordan. Now, the campaigns of Joshua have to do with the crossing of the Jordan on, right? And the Holy Spirit has gone ahead and enumerated these kings, these, these, these battles that took place under Moses before Joshua was in leadership, right? The first uh, six verses deal with it says, them did Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the children of Israel smite, and so on, right? Um, that's one point. Something else you may notice uh, in, in chapter 12. Um, there's a change in tone in chapter 12. It says, now these are the kings of the land whom the children of Israel smote and possessed their land on the other side. God is giving Israel the credit. Previously, we've noticed the emphasis that it's God that delivered the, land, the, the victory into their hands, right? This particular chapter is God chooses to recount their 31 victories. He gives them the credit. Israel smote and Israel smote. And in other words, as if Israel did it. It's kind of interesting uh, from God's point of view to recognize that he's giving them the credit. I, I think that's provocative. Uh, God chooses to, to, he's obviously accomplishing his purpose, but he's doing it through Israel. It's just like you and I. He may accomplish it. It's a privilege, of course, if he accomplishes his purposes through us. Um, and... Uh, but there's something else here that strikes me. It strikes me is that he went to the trouble of reaching back before the book of Joshua to pick up this so that he gets this complete list, and the list adds up to 31. And that reminds me of something that I learned 
on my last trip to Israel where I had the opportunity to spend an interesting afternoon with a, with a uh, rabbi who is in the, whose hobby, if you will, is the Kabbalah. The word, same root from which we get the word Kabbal. There's a, there is a, a, a sect or a group or a, uh, I don't want to call it a cult, it's not that strong, but it's a, uh, a special interest among some rabbis called the Kabbalah. These guys are particularly fascinated with what uh, you could call Jewish mysticism. And, um, and that fact isn't quite right either because Jewish mysticism implies some other things too. But basically what they're interested in or fascinated by is the structural qualities, the mystical qualities of the text itself. And um, so uh, uh, a mutual friend of ours who knew my interest in that general area had arranged for us to visit the home of these people. And my wife and I and, and this rabbi and his wife spent an afternoon in the most incredible fellowship you can imagine. Now, these are not believers in Jesus Christ. They're classical, orthodox, Jewish believers. And yet, despite the obvious uh, difference in viewpoint, we focused on what we had in common, had an incredible fellowship. And he shared with me the things of, uh, that they're rediscovering about the Kabbalah. One of the things he pointed out, they've rediscovered something that they call the law of the square. And they've come to the conclusion by just a... Oh, back up, I should back up. Uh, each of the 22 Hebrew letters has a numerical value. And uh, each of the letters has a, nu a unique numeric value. That means then, and incidentally, the 24 letters of the Greek alphabet do also. Hebrew and Greek happen to be two alphabets or languages whose alphabet also carries numerical value. Now, it's interesting that the Lord has chosen Hebrew for the Old Testament and Greek for the New as languages, and yet those languages carry numerical value. And as you can probably gather, if the, if the letters have... Now, incidentally, English doesn't have that exactly. We come close with what we sometimes call Roman numerals, where uh, the letter I is 1 and the letter V is 5, and the letter uh, M is... Um, is uh, um, how much? Thousand letter C is a hundred, and um, the um, and uh, you you probably uh, we, we I think we've talked about this before about what 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 you know the, the the symbol V if I hold up two fingers like this back during the Second World War that meant V for victory the Churchill symbol right and if I was a member of the counterculture uh, during the seventies and held up two fingers it was peace right and if I was in the Roman uh, Colosseum during the Christians being fed the lions and held up a V, it was five hot dogs, right? No? Okay, sorry. Yes, that's bad. That's really bad, isn't it? Yes. That was so bad I was stumbling myself if I was really going to go all the way through that. Um, bad. Anyway, Roman number. Point is, is that not all the letters in our alphabet have numerical values. Just certain ones, and obviously the, rhythmic, the notation is clumsy and as a result it fell in disuse after the uh, invention of Arabic positional notation. The Hindus invented the concept of zero so that one zero could represent ten and position, positional notation was adopted. That with the Arabic numerals gives us uh, uh, arithmetic as you and I know it. We take that for granted, but it was a major, major innovation when it occurred. But meanwhile, these two ancient languages, Hebrew and Greek, all the letters had numeric value, which had a peculiar byproduct. That means that any word had a, num a num numeric value. And so one of the things that the Hebrews did is they, when they, when they, they didn't have printing presses, so they had to copy their documents. If you wanted a copy of Isaiah, you got a scribe to make you a copy. And what he did was he would copy a page, he would sum the number, the letters on the one page, add them all up, and it came to a number, and he'd sum the page that he copied. And if they agreed, he'd go on to the next page. If they didn't, he'd burn the page he'd copied and start over. And that rigor, that religious rigor that they forced upon themselves, is why our manuscripts are so incredibly reliable. Everybody makes a big fuss over the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, found in, in the caves in Qumran. Hey, the amazing thing about the Dead Sea Scrolls is there aren't, they have a complete copy of the book of Isaiah and there's trivial differences between it and the one you and I enjoy. And so that one of the amazing things is that that, that religious commitment that the scribes had that, to whom we're indebted for the copies that we have today. But now, the point is, as these words have numerical value, that gives rise to all kinds of bizarre things. 
And they also just so that you, there's a whole thing you can get into studying the numbers of these of the text itself. And you say, well, gee, that's sort of a weird kind of tangent they're on. Uh, maybe it is and maybe it isn't because uh, they discovered several things. They discovered that there are numerical properties of the text that relate to the meaning of the text. One of the things they discovered, as I said, is the law of the square. They discovered that 13 squared is 169. 31 squared, reverse the 13, making it 31, and square that, you get 961, the reversal of 169. It's the only place that it occurs in the numbering system. The transposition of the number and its square is also transposed. And you say, that's kind of an interesting numerical oddity. The followers of the Kabbalah point out that they call 961 the signature of God. If you study portions of Genesis, there's a portion in the early part of Genesis called the Creation Hymn. It's a particular poem, poetic part of, of, of uh, the Creation Hymn. It opened the letters, the, the, the words that open it up and the words that close, Psalm to 961. The rabbis regard that as a signature of God. Um, if you take the name Abram and Sarai and Ishmael and sum them, it comes to 961. If you take the change in name from Abram to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah and Ishmael, it doesn't add up to 961, but if you take Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac, it adds up to 961. And so you're beginning to get the impression that as God is playing around with these names, there is a, a background, a numerical elegance that's lost on you and I, and maybe lost on them at that time but not in the text. And uh, I think we shared before the fact that they, these people are uh, uh, discovering that, that computers, looking at the Hebrew text, find that every fifth, if you take every 50th letter, the name uh, Elohim shows up 147 times in the Torah, too often to be an accident. And the side of that is if you take one letter out, it doesn't happen. blows the system. And so these, these numerical properties of the text are interesting. So now... Uh, and we could go on about this. There's a, a example after example after example of this that uh, this rabbi shared with us in the Old Testament. And of course, just freaked us out. And there's some fascinating passages about um, how uh, uh, um, um, Jacob and Leah and Rachel and how he loved Rachel more than life itself. And in the very numerics of those passages of Jacob and Rachel, it sums to the 1,000. And when you get to the Song of Solomon, it says it. The word 1,000 shows up there in a strange way. It doesn't make sense. It closes the chapter until you recognize that that's one of those places where the Kabbalah and the text coincide and it points back to the, to the, the, the love that, um, as, as exemplified between uh, J- uh, Jacob and Rachel and so on. So there, it's interesting that the very properties of the text itself uh, um, are, are uh, uh, add to or confirm the intent and, and the, uh, of the author. And uh, we find, by the way, this gives rise then to the same kinds of studies for the New Testament. Greek also, the 24 letters of the Greek alphabet, have numerical value, and you can roll those out. And that gives rise, there are those, and I'm one of these screwballs, that believes that every number, every word, every place name, in both the Old and New Testament, is relevant, is significant, was put there by the Holy Spirit. And this gives rise to, and, and you, can, you can take examples of this, you can discover that all the titles of Christ uh, son of Man, Son of God, so we all have a common denominator of 888. All the titles of Satan, the Red Dragon, and, and uh, Lucifer, etc., all have the common denominator of 666. And you get into this stuff, it's kind of interesting. Uh, but well, this gives rise to classic problems with this area, and that's the in the Gospel of John, where at the, at the resurrection when they're fishing, the Holy Spirit takes the trouble to let us know there were 153 fish caught. And why 153 fish? And there are books written speculating on the significance of 153 in terms of the text and so forth. So you can also you can carry this sort of thing probably into to unfruitful bypaths also. Um, and this, of course, gives rise to you know, the classic one. People who have done no gametry or, 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 or numerical analysis all, or all have their theories about the 666 that shows up, of course, in Revelation 13. And uh, uh, there is the view that the link to that is 
gametria in terms of the person's name, but also a textual link uh, elsewhere in the scripture, and I think we've been down that path before, so I won't take uh, too much time with it now. Um, well, maybe a little bit of time with it now. Um, <laughs> Since I see I'm a little ahead of schedule, I don't want to jump into 13 tonight because that'll screw up the whole deal for next week. So we'll just uh, uh, dally here a little bit. Um, the uh, oh, well, before I leave, before I leave chapter 12, what I'm leading up to is it's interesting to me that the Holy Spirit has constructed this list, even having to reach east of the Jordan, to come up with what? 31 kings. Whose victory? God's. The value of L which is the Hebrew name for God, is what do you think? 31. 31. You guessed it. Right on. So it's interesting that um, uh, as we study the text or we study the Bible, you keep having the feeling that if you knew just a little more Hebrew or had just a little deeper reach or could find a better concordance with better place names or a better map, that there's no end to the discoveries that one can unravel. In fact, one of the other views that I think is fascinating, but the, 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 uh, of those that are in the Kabbalah, Kabbalah, Kabbalah that they uh, have, is they believe that, that the text can never be exploited thoroughly. You'll never fully understand it until the Messiah comes. And when the Messiah comes, he will not only interpret the text, but he'll interpret the very spaces between the letters. That's the, that, that's the tradition, the, the, the strict rabbinical tradition. And that's really fascinating because that shows you how far they go in their um, extolling the Torah. Their particular focus is not the Old Testament as we know it. Their particular focus is the Torah, the, the, the five, what we call the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. In fact, they even believe that not only does the Torah describe the creation, there are those among them that believe that the Torah contains the very codes that caused the creation to happen. And this is a fascinating idea to me because uh, as, a, as a student, if you will, or whose profession is in the information sciences, it's interesting how we, we it, today's scientific world regards, looks at most sciences as really uh, subdivisions of, of, the, of the information sciences. You see a little bit of that, of course, well, you see some of that in the periodic table that you all saw in chemistry in high school or college. Uh, you see it if you're getting to, into uh, uh, advanced physics. You see the order, and again, everything becomes a function of numbers and relationships of that kind. Um, as we look at astronomy, of course, we touched upon that a little bit uh, last time. As we look at the DNA molecule as containing the codes that make you you, that give you your particular characteristic, it all boils down to a very complex but finite genetic code that's kept in the, that, that's, that's, uh, that's in the DNA molecule and has a, a mechanism so it can repeat itself, you know, replicate itself and become that which is you. The whole idea of cloning, in effect, is, it derives from that concept, that view, that, that system. So in our, in our sciences, we tend to recognize more and more that our physical world is a function of information. In fact, we speak in information theory of the, law, the entropy laws. And, we, and, and, of course, that ties to the physical science in terms of, uh, of uh, thermodynamics and the rest. So it's interesting to me from that whole background to look back and find these ancient rabbis clinging to the belief that the creation itself is brought about by a code, a, a blueprint, a, 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 a command, a, a detailed concept that is, they believe, simply the Torah. That another function of the, of the text of the Torah was the creation itself. And uh, uh, that's not a strange idea when we turn to John chapter 1. John opens his gospel with a few verses here that are kind of heavy. It's a tough gospel. To, it's actually the best gospel for a new Christian to read. It's, a, it's got much to commend it, but one of the things you have to somehow crawl over is this rather strange first few opening verses. To an uninitiated reader, they're, they're kind of strange. John just plunges right in and says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. That sounds like he's repeating himself. In the, in the beginning, it's actually in beginning, was the Word. And the Word is it's imperfect, it's continuous, in other words. It exists the Word. And the Word here in capitals in your Bible is because it's a title. It's a title of Jesus Christ. And until you know that, you have a tough time with those first few verses. 
In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And uh, it, uh, uh, it isn't until verse 14 that you begin to, that, that maybe the fog lifts a little bit because he said, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It's about here that most readers begin to realize what John, the gospel writer, is talking about is Jesus Christ. And the first few verses, it points out that he pre-existed, time itself. He, uh, in the beginning was the Word, he pre-existed. The Word was with God, the Word was God. He was God, and yet he's dis- there's a st- distinct personality. He was with God. And so those ideas uh, are, are complementary. And the same was in the beginning, God. And all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Now, it's after I learned of the rabbinical view of the Torah that the title of Jesus Christ as the Word of God had a whole new meaning. He was the Word of God incarnate. And uh, so that's uh, 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 an interesting view that John described, in fact, opens his gospel with, that's not at all inconsistent with the the view of the the rabbis who hold that uh, the Torah, that when, you know, is, it contains the very commands, the very essence, the very codes that brought the universe itself into existence. That would imply that hidden away in those numbers and sentences and spacings and, and in the integrity of that design is uh, our periodic table, is, uh, is everything. Isn't that wild? Crazy idea. Um, can I prove it? No, I'll wait and let him confirm it when the time comes. Uh, I'm not to, about to presume on that, that, that chore. But I think it is fascinating that in these traditions of the ancient rabbis that uh, that uh, uh, we have uh, these ideas that are not at all inconsistent with uh, what the New Testament uh, New Testament teaches. Anyway, we're, we've we've uh, finished uh, the first twelve chapters of the Book of Joshua, which of course is the, the the conquest of the land. What we're going to do uh, from chapter thirteen on is allocate this right up to the last two the last two chapters. We'll deal with the cities of refuge and that sort of thing. But chapters 13 through 22 will allocate the land, and we're not going to badger that detail too much, although we will swing through it and, and, and uh, highlight uh, some of the, the more salient points. We're going to learn some interesting things about the tribes. Uh, we won't make it a comprehensive study of the 12 tribes, but as we go, we'll learn some interesting prophecies about the tribes, and we'll discover there's some interesting uh, relationships. We will touch upon this strange character called Balaam next time. And then we're also going to delve, and we've been talking a lot about Joshua. One of the guys that's uh, really been all, uh, all along all the way is a guy by the name of Caleb. And we're going to find that Caleb makes out pretty well. So we can draw some very interesting inferences about our friend uh, Caleb. And uh, we'll go through and we'll highlight quickly each of the 12 tribes, what they get and why. And, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll also talk about the codes that are hidden in the lists of the 12 tribes uh, uh, as we go through this. And... Uh, We'll, the pace will pick up. We should uh, we should uh, do pretty well. Uh, chapters 21 and 22, or t- uh, 21 will be the the uh, Levite cities, and then we'll get to the cities of uh, the the uh, cities of refuge, and then we'll have a uh, you know a summary, fabulous fabulous chapter at the end. So we'll just we'll just keep moving. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Book of Joshua. It's interesting that Paul in the book of Romans says that you and I can be more than conquerors. And when you, when you read chapter 8 of Romans, the last half of that chapter, uh, that's an incredible thing when you look at Joshua's Jack type. You get all carried away with what he can do, and you sit, sit back and say, wow, isn't that wild? And you've got to stop short and recognize that pro- the promises that God has given you exceed those that Joshua enjoyed, and that is, that's dynamite. Let's spar our hearts. Father, we praise you that you indeed have made us more than conquerors through him that loved us. We would ask, Father, that you would instill in us, the, as a gift from you, faith, as David and as Joshua and Caleb enjoyed. We would ask this gift, Father, that in all that through this faith we might be more pleasing in your sight, that we might enjoy a closer fellowship with you and be more effective as your servants. For we ask all this that his name might be glorified with whom we have to do, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.